Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for what's going to be our final webinar um, in our 2021-22 series of Planning Live. My name's Karen Hamilton, and I'm a planning partner at Brodie's. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by my partner, Elaine Ferguson Black, and Brian Evans, Professor of Urbanism and Landscape at the Macintosh School of Architecture, the Glasgow School of Art, and Director of the Glasgow Urban Laboratory. So if you've tuned in before, you'll be familiar with the format. It's an informal chat this afternoon um, on planning matters. And we're absolutely delighted to have with us Brian Evans. Brian is a chartered town planner, a chartered designer, advisor to the United Nations, Glasgow's first city urbanist, and he practices, researches, teaches, and speaks widely on contemporary and future city urbanism, urban design, and landscape planning. Brian is the co-author of the recently published Scotland's Urban Age 2, which uh, Brodie's was delighted to co-sponsor, which looks at the future of Aberdeen, Glasgow and Edinburgh and their regions in light of COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges of the climate emergency, Brexit, the global financial crash and the war in Ukraine. It's exhausting just to think about all of that. Elaine is going to chat with Brian about the planning issues which cities face are facing, but do please use the Q&A function to ask Brian anything about urbanism and planning within reason, which you've always wanted to know, but have been too scared to ask. So over to you, Elaine and Brian. I'm going to keep a, an eye on questions coming in, so I may interject from time to time if there uh, are any questions appropriate to ask, for, ask you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Karen. And good afternoon, uh, Brian. It's good to see you again. We've been spending a lot of time together recently, albeit virtually, um, some of it. Um, it is a it's a hefty report. Um, it's it's very detailed, and you and I have spent um, a lot of time on it. And I thought before I ask you some specific questions, and all with a kind of planning base, I thought it might be useful if you just took a little time to explain some of the background to the report and um, some of the information that you've used in it to come to your um, kind of findings. And I suppose one of the kind of first questions of why do you call it shocks to the system? Thank you, Elaine. Good afternoon, everybody. I recognize lots of the names um, in the list here. Um, uh, it's very nice. I, sorry, I can't see you all, but um, that's the nature of these things, isn't it? Um, yeah, shocks to the system. Karen actually hinted at that in her introduction there, that um, when the three chambers asked us to consider reprising um, Scotland's Urban Age 1 that's on the screen there from 2018 in the light of COVID. Um, we said, well, well, we'd like to do that, but only if we can consider COVID in the context of the climate emergency. Um, and, and then as we started to think about those things, we realised that everything we do is overcast by long shadows from the global financial crash and Brexit. Um, so there's, an un there's uncertainty in the air. And of course, the last couple of years, everybody was looking at the consequences of COVID. Um, and a lot of people were looking at the consequences of, of the climate emergency. Not too many people were looking at their interlinkages. A lot of people were. Uh, and I suspect a lot of people on this call um, today were, but perhaps the body politic wasn't really. So th that was the point. Um, now, Elaine, I know you don't want me to present this afternoon, but I have pulled out one or two images from uh, the report, which being a visual person, and I think a lot of people in the call are visual people, might, might help us. So, so could I have my first slide, please? This is just the global goals and um, the national outcomes from the National Performance Framework, NPF, not to be confused with NPF4, of course. Um, and it, 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 it talks about the importance of a lingua franca um, across nation states um, provided by the global goals and their targets. 
um, and how NPF starts to move us from uh, outputs to, um, to outcomes, really, and uh, hints at the need for systems thinking. Next slide, please. Um, and there's a, there's a lot said about systems thinking in the report. Um, three, everybody, everybody draws all their systems um, design diagrams, a circle, um, and the one on the left is the, is the um, cocktail of change that will come up during, the, um, uh, during the, our conversation, Elaine, um, and it's a modification of the cocktail of change from SUA1. The one in the middle is Donut Economics, which I think a lot of people will be familiar with, and then the one on the right is the Taylor Wessing um, thought processes, and we can re refer to these as, as and when as appropriate. Ne next slide, please. Um, because of uncertainty uh, and because of the need for systems and thinking, we, we, we devoted quite a bit of time to thinking around about scenarios for dealing with uncertainties. And there's quite a lot in the report. There's, there are individual business sector scenarios, but you see on the left here, the, the impact of um, the, the, the summary uh, effects of COVID and the consequences for uh, different scenarios. And on the right, um, scenarios for climate change. These two don't necessarily map one on top of the other, but they do interact. Next. Um, in, in terms of the cocktail of change, demographics is a big issue. And Scotland's Urban Age 1 talked about growth uh, and decline. Um, and there's a lot talked about um, the east of Scotland growing more quickly than the west of Scotland. Um, but if I direct your attention to the map and the green area on the map, you see the areas in, in Scotland that are currently growing um, and the rest that are shown black and in, in grey are the ones that are suffering decrease. Now, all of this needs to be nuanced um, and it comes with, um, it comes with health warnings. Um, but the little medical diagram at the top there um, shows the implications for growth uh, in Scotland um, of EU expansion, uh, the EU referendum. And of course, we've all read that, that the latest demographic trends are predicting decline in Scotland's population from 24, 25 onwards. The table um, is, is, all of this is from the report. You can, you can delve into it in more depth if you would like, but um, <clears throat> it shows that Scotland's grown from over the period 70 to 2020, grown by 5%. But if you look at the other countries, Norway, for example, has grown at 38%, um, Finland, 20%, Denmark, 17%. So it begs a question about our human capital and growth of our human capital. Next slide, please. Um, we say a lot about geography and the, this, these are the NPF4 zones laid on top in the center um, of the operational area of HIE, the operational area of Scot Scottish Enterprise, the operational area of South of Scotland Enterprise, and on the right, the operational areas of the city, region and growth deals. Um, and, and we talk quite a lot about the need to bring some of these things into register. Next slide, I think it's the, is it the last one. So there's the growth deals uh, on the left. Uh, slide on the right, um, deals more with the specific cities. And we make the point that there are only four cities in Scotland who elect a city government um, uh, to, to deal with the governance of the city. And the, the other three, now four, are completely different in, in respect of governance and they're, they're different in economy of scale. And we felt one of the changes this time is the degree to which Dundee has moved into the same constellation as Aberdeen, Glasgow and Edinburgh. There's two odd couples in the four big cities. Um, the, the, the city that's largest territorially is four times the size of the city that's smallest territorially, but they have almost the same population density, although the larger one has not got four times the population of the smallest one. So, I mean, that, that's interesting. The other odd couple, uh, is that two of the cities have, and the other two cities have almost the same, um, have almost the same territorial area, but one is three and a bit times the population of the other. So there's 
you know, which city is which and does it matter? Um, but I think a lot of this has implications for the way we govern ourselves. So big, long, um, complicated answer to your first question. But the, the interaction of COVID and the inter uh, with climate emergency and increasing with the geography of Scotland and, and how we go about governing ourselves. Thank you. And and there is, I mean, there's there is so much in in the report. Um, it, it is it's it's so detailed, and I would encourage everybody to to delve into it. But I'm going to make that really simple, quite kind of question because I'm a simple person. And one of the things yeah, that yeah, sure. <laughs> that that's that stuck in my mind from the first report was the statistic that by 2050, 70 percent of the world's population are going to be living, you know, in cities. And yet we've just had the last two years where stay local, you know, and encouraging people to stay out of cities, which is really why the chambers, you know, were asking you to do the, the updated report. You know, so would you say that the pandemic and that move to staying local has changed that statistic or are we still going to be by 2050 still most people living um, in city environments? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we can't handle the numbers of people in the world unless we do move to that. Um, so, I mean, that's a simple, it's a simple fact on one hand, but there's, there's, there's quite a lot of um, mis misapprehension and misunderstanding around about this proposition. Don't know that the, the, the pandemic changed the subtlety around about urban concentration, but it didn't change the, the overall proposition around about urban concentration. Now, the, the, the first report talks about uh, how the jet age combined with the net age. So, you know, we, we, we talk in the report about the work of Frances Cairncross, people like that. She wrote a book called The Death of Distance with the internet and the internet of things. You know, we will all be able to work from wherever we want to, um, telework from sky or, or whatever. And, and certainly uh, people can, if they've got fiber broadband, they, 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 they can do that. Um, but what we found is that actually the combination of the net age and the jet age and the work I did for the United Nations actually compounded urban concentration. So, um, and we see that uh, uh, in that diagram, the demographics I showed you of Scotland, um, that, that over the past 20 years, we've seen urban concentration around the three big cities in, part in particular. What the pandemic has done the introduction of localism, and there's a lot in the report about localism, the demos research, um, 20 minute neighborhoods, of course, I know we'll come on to that, um, Elaine. Um, it's, it's maybe changed the regional dynamics a little bit, but it, it, it's difficult to see how it's really gonna change um, the, uh, the overall nature of urban concentration. So, so I think we can expect to, to see more localism within the city region, but the city region and the, 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 uh, the three um, cities. Um, I'm so sorry. How do I get rid of this? <laughs> um, uh, the co urban concentration with, with, with within the three cities. Um, so, so we're seeing in Glasgow, we're seeing in, in Edinburgh and Aberdeen, more concentration on, on some of the local centres within the cities, but we're not really seeing the development dynamics changing greatly. Yeah, um, you mentioned, you know, obviously localism there and that um, and the 20 minute neighbourhood, which, you know, from a planning point of view, we've all been discussing. Um, and I know the report looks at um, examples, you know, in Paris and uh, Australia about the 20 minute, 15 minute or 20 minute neighbourhood. Um, is there anything that we, you know, in Scotland, planners, developers, um, you know, councillors can learn from what's been done, you know, elsewhere that we should, as we now go forward and take forward the 20 minute neighbourhoods, perhaps in more detail than we have before, any, any lessons we can learn? Yeah, I mean, we say in the report, the 20 minute neighbourhood's not new, right? Anybody who's read The Death and Life of Great American Cities that Jane Jacobs wrote and published in the early 1970s was all about the strength and importance of the neighbourhood. So, so the 20-minute neighbourhood is, is just a body politic catching up with what good urbanism has been on about for quite some considerable time. Um, uh, and I, I, 
I don't feel qualified to preach to this group of people really I, I mean looking at a lot of the names on the uh, on the call um, they will all be immersed in um, the dynamics of the 20 minute neighborhood um, it is fundamentals of good urbanism it is fundamentals of good planning um, and one of the reasons we cited the Melbourne example is because they were already retrofitting uh, Melbourne in advance of the pandemic and and they already had embraced the 20 minute neighborhood as as a diagnostic to um, overcome uh, the quintessential American city if you like of the distribution to the suburbs and all and all the rest of it and densification of suburbs uh, and things so so yeah I mean we're, we're fortunate in Scotland because the 20 minute neighborhood as opposed to the 15 minute city you know I've been cracking this joke the French walk more quickly than we do so they've got 15 minute city we've got 20 minute neighborhoods but um, uh, but we've we've embraced this it's mainstream uh, and it relates to our national place policy um, and and therefore it's it's um, it's a strong proposition for us all to work with it's just good planning basically yeah um, and it is, it's it's obviously 20 minute neighbourhoods a feature of NPF4 uh, and we now we've kind of heard that NPF4 is going to come, a revised draft is going to be a kind of autumn. Now in 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 uh, Scotland's Urban Age 2 you welcome the draft NPF4 um, and you're you're quite specific in saying that the purpose of, of SUA is not to critique the, the draft um, NPF. But you do kind of question some of the geography about it and you kind of, you know, you had that that diagram up before where you kind of showed the diagram and the areas from MPF4. And you suggest that the MPF4 perhaps takes too procedural an approach to place. And I, I wondered whether, you know, given the audience here, it might be useful for you to kind of explain your comments um, around that. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we were working with some of this. We, we were trying to think about what the best way to deal with NPF4 would be. Um, and I, you know, I'd, I participated in responses to NPF4 as, as part of wider groups, the Landscape Institute or the RTPI or the RSE and, and things like that. And it was in one of those that Duncan McClellan from Glasgow University and myself went off on one about about Scotland's need to, to practice better geography um, and how um, when government um, disperses money to local authorities, it does so for the local authority areas. And if you start dividing up the local authority areas, um, then, then there can be a mixed message about what people are receiving money for. Um, and that took us into areas about the micromanagement of local authorities by, by both governments, Westminster and um, uh, Holyrood, um, and the importance of, um, or the need to push back on the extent of ring fencing. Um, so, so, so it's a difficult thing to do because one understands that these areas were drawn as, as well, I hope they were drawn as, as a, a provocation, um, but there comes a point in time where, where you need to have a degree of joined upness between um, th those who are issuing national policy, how that tracks down and um, how at the local area, what has devolved to the local uh, area, to the local city uh, in order for them to be able to get on with delivery. And we felt that, uh, and, and, and say in, in some depth in the report that, that our, our cities in particular are, are micromanaged. Um, and that this, this is becoming a bit of a challenge um, when we've now got in play things like NPF4 and leveling up, um, and, and leveling up fantastic analysis, but seems to, um, seems to really be a recipe for port barreling. So, so ra rather than having uh, regional and national strategies about things, we get we then get back into the competitiveness about uh, well, we'll put in five bids for green ports and all all the rest of it. And um, it all depends whether you've got a 
um, a government, you know, I mean, it, it becomes quite dysfunctional in Scotland because there's, there's, there's not too many Conservative MPs to go and port barrel to um, in Scotland. So it, 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 it gets all, all of that gets in the way, I think. And we, we were, we're campaigning for more clarity, really. We're not, sorry, Karen, we're not campaigning for local government reorganisation, which is the, the best way to kick the can down the road. Um, but never thought I'd hear these words come out of my mouth, but the, the, you know, the, the Cameron coalition seemed to be able to work with the devolved administrations in setting up these regional growth deals and city region deals. And they're not perfect, but they were being made to work. And the potential of having yet more different configurations and these slightly bizarre five areas where you have five motor words and those motor words, um, those, those, those motor words um, are intended to, to um, be the lead in, in the, the, the five different areas, but we're dealing, dealing with all five motor words. And I think that's what we meant, about, or, or your words about being overly procedural, Procedure. really. And, it, like, and it's like check, a, a checklist of, sorry, a check, a, just a checklist, all of the, you know, do we just, do we just tick the boxes? So we've got a policy for this, got a policy for that bit of place, policy for that bit, policy for that bit, everything will be fine then. You still have to design the bloody things. Yeah. I could just jump in um, at this point because we actually have a question um, that, that uh, Pam, Pam Ewan has, has raised in the Q&A, um, Brian, just on NPF force so I thought I'd just take the chance uh, to mention it while we're while we're there so so Pam is asking to what extent you consider that the draft MPF4 sets out to facilitate change that is anticipated in in your report and any key aspects missing so I suppose it's the extent to which maybe you want to get into that Brian but would there have been anything that you'd really would have given the conclusions from the report is there anything that you would really have hoped to have seen in npf4 that that simply isn't there um but i i mean i, th I think we'll go on to talk about this elaine won't we about about how the how the geography shake shakes out i th I, th I think that's that's quite important um and if those areas were conceived of as talking points, um, that's fine, and it, and it's generated it's generated a lot of discussion uh, ab about that. Um, I, I mean, the 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 half dozen uh, overarching policies um, are quite generic in NPF four, um, and and then we we go from that to a kind of atomized distribution of sets of policies um, so we we i think we feel that there needs to be a, a more coherent uh, approach brought to these things um, and i'm on record of having said you know in the old days i would have said to somebody did your tracing paper slip when when you were drawing the area for central scotland um, because it it appears to include loch lomond and the trossachs but it excludes half of the lothians and half of the metropolitan area of Glasgow, which has left a lot of people scratching their heads, really. That said, urbanists and landscape architects and all of us have for decades been talking about the importance of having a coherent spatial policy for central Scotland, like Eba Emshire Park and like the Randstad in the Netherlands. So, um, so to come back to uh, Pam's question, do we consider draft NPF four sets out to facilitate change anticipated in only in part, I think, is the answer to that. Um, but that's because it's a planning document. And a lot of what the, the report is about can't be dealt with by planning alone. Uh, it's all about it's all about productivity, uh, growing human capital, growing human capital in Scotland is incredibly important. We are headed for a declining population. We don't have control over uh, migration uh, in Scotland. Uh, and we don't, um, uh, and as, as a consequence of that, it's very difficult for our, any of our local authorities actually, but 
it's it's very difficult for for the, the the cities and the city regions to really get a hold of that and try and attract talent. Um, if there's huge impediments put in the way of um, using our uh, using all of our universities as engines of stickiness uh, in cities, um, where there's countless numbers of talented kids come from other countries, and if we're going to turf them all out. I mean, the, the, in, instead of allowing them to, to stay, it's a big, big uh, issue. And the four big cities in particular are sticky cities. People like Scotland, people like the Scottish cities. So, so that's something that, that um, I don't think NPF4 on its own can deal with. I'm, I'm going to take you to the sticky cities right now. We've kind of talked generally, have a little <laughs> bit more kind of detail about, you know, kind of Aberdeen, Glasgow uh, and Edinburgh. And obviously in the first report, you looked at what makes those cities, you know, those cities, what, you know, they're individual, but but kind of similar. Um, and I it was kind of see whether you identified from the report any standout changes, you know, in the cities, you know, since you did the first report. And what would be the priorities for each city um, that you think, um, you know, kind of going forward? Mm -hmm. uh, standout, standout changes. I, I mean, the, the, the first report talked about the extent to which uh, Edinburgh in particular and Aberdeen were doing well and, and Glasgow was, was in the teeth of transition. Um, uh, Aberdeen, is having more existential challenges asked of it uh, because of the increased importance of decarbonating the economy, uh, for example. Not a criticism of Aberdeen because they they know that and they and they've you know we at the Aberdeen launch we had a really good discussion about all of that so it's, it's not critical. I think as I've already hinted at the the changes that have taken place over the last decade in Dundee really propelled on the uh, into into the arena of the of the four cities the, the, diff, the different people got a view on that um, they, they, Dundee still lags behind a bit in terms of um, e economy and things but that that's that's not an excuse to exclude it um, or shouldn't shouldn't be we can't we can't we can't work with um, economic indices alone uh, uh, really. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> it, it, it was whether there was, you know, kind of um, things that the, that the city should be prioritising. I know, you know, for example, I think we, we'd highlighted, um, you know, in the report that Edinburgh's already got quite a lot of city centre living, but Glasgow and Aberdeen don't. They should maybe mm -hmm. perhaps be where, you know, there should be a focus. There's that bit about moving um, towards um, perhaps tourism and the kind of experience kind of economy from previously might have been in industry. It was just whether there were any kind of changes they go gosh that's re that that's really changed from the first report you know or uh -huh. is it just okay. actually still on the same trajectory well there's no silver bullets so you know densifying the city centers with uh with city center living is, is a good thing to do but it's not a silver bullet uh really um and i, I think we think that's that's quite important uh, to, to recognize. Um, the other thing that's very clear, because I, I see there's another question and sorry about this, Karen, but it, it's germane to this particular point um, that the first report was all about the transition from the industrial city to the knowledge city. Um, that was to do with a lot of the work I'd been doing for the United Nations about post-industrial is what we've left. Where, where are we going to? And we posited in the first report about Scotland cities being proto-knowledge cities. And I've spoken to you about that before, Elaine, about how I got warned off that by BBC Scotland, about this is reporting Scotland, Brian, you can't use phrases like proto-knowledge. You know, you need, to, <laughs> you, need to, you need to explain what you mean, but knowledge, the knowledge city being the destination of where, of where we want to go to. And the little model in the previous report um, remains true, uh, where the requirements that you need for an extractive economy uh, or um, 
uh, you know, a manufacturing or industrial economy, let's say, are radically different to the spatial requirements you need for a, uh, for a knowledge economy, where really the only the only element of sp spatial dynamics you need is proximity. Now, the 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 pandemic gave that a bit of a tanking, really, um, in in the sense that that the the experience economy took a real tanking in in our city centres, um, but all of them have the combination of knowledge hubs in terms of the universities um, uh, the, 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 they are expressed in different ways in the three principal cities and Dundee they're expressed in different ways but you you've got that proximity of those things um, and we we are returning to a degree of proximity to um, and, and we're all very very pleased to be able to do that um, you know to be to be able to meet for coffee again uh, and, and that's that that could I argue that is a return to normal um, but I was I, I was in in Garnet Hill yesterday for the first time in a long time and I was I was struck by the I walked past the primary school um, there and there's 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 a, a huge raft of infrastructure that needs to go along with um, residential um, residential population in in city centres. So, so there's there's it, more residential population in city centres is a good idea. Um, it's not a silver bullet. Um, it, it comes back to models of fifteen and twenty minute cities, um, uh, and and uh, probably what what is at least as important. Um, as um, as that is is um, the work that Ryden and Mark Robertson did as, as as part of the work, where where Mark was seeing stated preferences in city centre offices changing. So as opposed to being projections, actual prefer preferences for smaller but higher spec offices. Um, and we're seeing that in the office market in the city centres. We're seeing it in the residential market uh, across the country, which is just seems to be going bananas. Um, yeah. um, and uh, so in the report, you look at kind of some scenarios, you know, and, and what might happen in different sectors, you know, depending on um, actions that are that are taken um, is is that kind of scenario planning something that planning authorities should be using when they're preparing development plans? You know, looking at what if I do this and if I don't do that and what do I need to do kind of first? Has it got some sort of um, synergy with the kind of planning, uh, development planning? Yeah, it, it does, but um, it's, it, it's a wee bit harder for, for public authorities to do scenario planning. I mean, if, if you're a corporate entity, you, you can look at some catastrophe implications um, in terms of the implications for your company. So you, 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 can, you can paint out a series of different scenarios and you can work with those to help build your resilience. Um, I, I, think, I think we can all... Um, understand what would happen if our planning authorities who have to who have to publish all of this stuff of course is issues papers and things we're, we're looking at some of the some of the more difficult um, propositions around about scenarios but we do we do need to do it really we, we, we need to look at those and the the slide I had up the interplay between climate change scenarios and COVID recovery scenarios and the consequences that's got for built fabric, decarbonating, decarbonizing the economy. These are, these are quite considerable. Um, and maybe scenarios might be a way to, um, to, to be able to help retain a degree of flexibility and openness in the next generation of uh, development plans without coming up for the answer, with the answer. So this area here is going to be this, and this area here is going to be 
that without being as, as specific a, a, about that, but being more criteria based and, and more, more overarching ra rather than being driven down to a lot of detail um, and, and retaining that agility and flexibility. I, I, suppose that, yeah, we're I, for. I, I suppose I think it is that kind of flexibility the report you know makes the cities are going to have to be kind of like you know flexible kind of moving forward I thought I'm conscious because Karen will probably be chasing us on soon given the time so what I thought you know my final question was and it's probably like the longest question there are seven key findings you know in the report yeah. and many have a distinct kind of planning aspect which again for the audience here is of, of interest I suppose um can you summarize the seven key findings, you know, what people need to take away from the report? Um, and I suppose, you know, top three things that you hope that those people, you know, involved in planning might might take away in action. So this, the seven key um, findings are, first of all, around about uncertainty, that we, we don't see that going away anytime soon. Um, and... Uh, that, that that leads on to the, the second element, which is about the importance of systems thinking, using and developing the place principle around about systems thinking um, and the integrated and indivisible nature of the SDGs. So, so we, 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 we maybe need a, 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 a nuanced evaluation framework so that you don't decide on this is the best solution for this without first of all evaluating that against all of the rest of the cocktail of change so that the, the best solution overall may not be the very best for the particular. This, this is siloed thinking and systems thinking is important. Um, competitiveness and productivity and human capital. Um, we, we shouldn't get hung up on, on all of this too much and on the supply side of planning because our, our competitiveness, productivity and human capital is going to be of incredible importance. Um, fourthly, the, 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 the point about delegating governance to the cities, avoiding the micromanagement um, of, of cities, building capacity in uh, urban policy, urban design, urbanism, um, but devolving delivery at the, to the local level and empowering. And, and the, big, the big cities have got big, um, have got big departments, but a lot of the smaller local authorities are more lithe and more agile um, because they have to be in, in order to be able to do things. And we've hollowed out that capacity. Um, and as you know, Elaine, we do have a pop at the Scottish Cities Alliance, which we didn't think was fit for purpose. And we still don't think is fit for purpose. Although it's a good idea to have a Scottish Cities Alliance, it should really be about a think tank that develop, you know, that disseminates policy and its capacity should be enhanced in order to be able to do that. Um, the other, the other three were regional planning, regional agencies, but with delivery delegated, um, place and urban and urbanism that we tend to have a, a, an over reliance on plans. And anytime something else comes, oh, well, we need to make a new plan. Um, so you know, the local place plans. We have to sooner or later we have to empower our communities and resource them to be able to do things for themselves rather than constantly making plans on their behalf. Um, probably just as well we're not all in the one room when uh, quite a number of people who are listening to this probably want to take me aside and give me a C in two when I've said some of these things. And then the, 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 the last one is about the relationship of the genius loci and the zeitgeist. So the zeitgeist is about this cocktail of demographic, climate and technological change, but the genius loci is what we see behind Karen there. Which is, the, which is the stunning nature of, of our cities and city regions. So we've, we've got to strike that balance. The three big takeaways is um, being systemic about place rather than overly prescriptive about place, um, empowering communities, 
to work within within that um uh and um uh the the micromanagement uh of uh city and 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 delegating governance to cities and city regions to actually get on with it i mean quite quite the contrary of what some people's opinions are in fact the 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 local bodies stakeholders and the communities of the three city regions are the people who really know what need to be done there so you you you, you need to devolve principles you need to disseminate best practice but they need to be given the freedom to actually actually configure it for themselves I think that's a, a great note for us to, to, to be winding up on. So well well done, Brian. Um, and thanks, thanks very much for that. I think lots of fat, fascinating stuff for, for everyone on the, the call to be chewing over. And I've particularly noted down fewer plans, more delivery, because I know that that will strike a chord with, uh, with many on the calls, including, I'm sure, uh, the, the planning officers them, themselves. Um, so it really just remains, I think, for me at this point, we could we could talk all day um, about about the report and 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 on into next week, I think. But um, both of you have done a, an excellent job in taking us us round that tour. So thanks everyone for for joining us today, and and special thanks to you, Brian, um, for for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. So a reminder to everyone that the report can be found um, at, at a link on our website and also on the website for each of the Chambers of Commerce for Aberdeen, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And we will also make Brian's slides available um, with, with the link um, to, to this afternoon's podcast so that people can have a, a closer look at those and, and scrutinise them up closely. So. Um, I mentioned at the start, this is the last of our planning live series as we head into the summer holidays. I'm sure they can't come soon enough for everyone. Um, so we're always interested to hear if you have any suggestions of topics or indeed speakers that you might like to suggest for the next series, which will start again in the autumn. So do get in touch if you have any thoughts on that front or indeed if you would like to volunteer yourself for a chat with us on Planning Live, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So that is all for this afternoon, folks. Um, we'll be back after the summer, so more information on, on that and dates for your diaries will come out um, in due course. So really just remains for us to say goodbye and I hope everyone has a lovely summer break and thanks again to Brian. So it's goodbye from us. And goodbye from him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.